Um, we've got an hour for this, but please, there are time for questions at the end. But if you do have any urgent questions, feel free to post in, post in the box. And uh, assuming I'm not ignoring you, I'll answer you as quick as I can. So moving down the session, just a little bit of background to me, if you wonder who I am at the end of the phone, plug out with your data storage and everything. So my name is Paul Taylor. Uh, I've been a member of the BCS oh, for about four years, maybe five years now almost. Uh, my background is change management, uh, hence the purpose of the discussion, I guess. I've uh, worked in a number of industries, mainly finance, uh, worked in old gaps, charities and professional bodies. I do a number of other activities to try and keep myself busy and a, 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 med, and a chair for some charities and social enterprises. I wrote a book earlier this year uh, called So You Want to Go Contracting, and those may be unfortunate enough, actually, you might have joined the webinar I had on that earlier in the year. Um, I do a speaking on a variety of subjects, I do a piece of mentoring. Um, I work at the Oak University as a lecturer on their STEM school uh, covering technology management. I gained an MBA from New York University nearly 20 years ago, showing my age, and I'm studying very, very slowly for a, a PhD at Middlesex University, I'm not going backwards. And therefore, just to mention that I'm just really fine to have been a member of the BCS uh, for nearly five years. So let's just get on to the crux of the presentation. So basically, I've split into three, well, four areas of which the fourth area is a, is a wrap up. The first area I want to talk about is how we define what change is. It's a very vague subject, um, and I understand what goes on. There's a number of key themes I want to sort of cover as part of the, uh, part of the uh, discussion. Uh, we'll cover them in part two. But the crux of the uh, presentation, or the majority of presentations, is going to be running for a very simple model on how we can implement change successfully, and that leads into the final wrap up. So, Without wasting people's time, let's move into the first area, which is what is change. So, basically, what is change? So, I, having not much to do at work today, I googled earlier on today the definition of change management, and I got 1.1 billion results. Uh, I did scroll down and boys to the thing at the top, which implies there's lots of definitions on it. Um, some of them stress the proactive nature of change, where you uh, actually say you're proactively going to make change. And some people stress change is an emergent phenomenon. Uh, however, we've only got one hour and uh, we can want to debate this with here forever. So I think for the purpose of this presentation, we define change as a proactive change or an alteration to organisational activity, i.e., you want to make a change to activity. So right now we've defined what change is. We probably it's worthwhile to move on to some of the key themes of, of change uh, for implementing change successfully. Uh, so uh, there's seven of them on the list, uh, four on this slide, and two, three over the next couple of slides. I think the first item is around to ensure that to implement change successfully, you need a systematic and controlled process, uh, which, uh, which covers a large amount of preparation work uh, and control and feedback during implementation. More about that later. I think the other key item is number two, which is actually probably, probably the most important one, especially on large change is the ability to cope with uncertainty and vagueness and ambiguity and issues and risks. Again, that's a common theme when we go through the simple model at the end. I think item three is, anybody who's worked on change can sort of agree with me on this, it's hard work. Uh, no fair change has been implemented by not doing that much work. It requires a lot of focus, determination, dedication. Now, I think the key point there is that the end is the devil's in the detail. You know, the small, the small minor change of an issue uh, can cause all sorts of havoc, you know, try to change a few greater than science, a few less, less than science and see what happens. The next item is number four, which again is another key one, is the, uh, the importance of people or stakeholder management. Um, basically all change in, 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 in impacts people, um, so you need to understand how to manage people. That obviously requires a human management element, which we'll talk about later. Uh, require regular and appropriate communication, and you really need a supportive culture to, to implement change. Um, the next item is number five, which is change is not an island, um, which is me trying to sound intelligent as about five. Well, it's politely saying is you can't implement change on your own. All organisations, whether you're a, a bank, a charity, a oil firm, you have a number of interactive parties. Uh, some of them can be internal parties like other teams, other departments. And most firms have external parties they deal with, which are suppliers, uh, customers, industry parts, it should be industry partners, but industry parties is the same, regulators, market infrastructure. 
So it's really implementing change, it's not just an internal organization thing, it's liaising with various number of other parties. Uh, number six is you basically need good people or relatively skilled people to do it. You know, that's what I'm trying to implement to change if you've got the right internal skills. So that involves having a project sponsor who is supportive and can actually sponsor the change. Uh, change manager, project manager, program manager, and then what phrase you prefer. And they need good skills or change management skills to understand and to implement it. And you need subject matter experts uh, to, to be involved in it. And you need a good project team, which is like most team building, you need a variety of stuff. And there's a various of others as well, depending on what you're doing. If you know, technology, you might good software coders, testers, DBAs. If you've got legal involved, you need good lawyers to understand what you're doing. The list is almost endless. I think the other key to remember when you're running through change, a change is a journey um, it's a, and, a, and expect problems. Um, so therefore you need to be realistic about what, what, what you can implement yeah, and the implementation must not be rushed otherwise it won't be implemented properly. Uh, and I use this diagram here just to try and illustrate this point and this right, is a very sort of crude and simple way um, uh, a diagram of change. So you normally have a startup, uh, and when this project starts running, the change running, you get loads of enthusiasm, the people are very happy. And then you start to hit some problems, or you get a sort of amount of worry, it gets worse, it becomes panic, uh, then it comes despair. And then once you work through this range of problems, you end up stabilizing and running normally. And my old boss used to say, marriage is like that, so if change is like a marriage, you know, it's good days and it's bad days, but long term it's very good, but you need to work it in. So therefore, we've covered a number of the key things uh, covering change. Um, uh, probably worthwhile now if we move on to item three, which is basically the very simple model how to implement change. And it covers uh, those five areas underneath. So I think the first area is, um, sort of five areas there listed on the left of the, of the slide. The first one emphasizes all the pre-work that needs to be done. Uh, once you've done the pre-work, you can work on to change assessments then you can define the implementation approach through to implementation and then to review. I think the key point to determine, to try and bring out here is the amount of work that needs to be done prior to the implementation. So you need to do an assessment and define the approach and think about what you're doing before you run into implementation. So if we start to look at these each areas individually, and we look at the very first one there, define the end state and what success is. Um, this is based around sort of like four very key points really. I think the first one is, uh, basically the first one really says why you're implementing this change. Why you're going to be working 24 hours a day and spending all your weekends working and counting your holidays to implement a change. So basically you need to understand a very clear strategic reason for that. Linked to that you need to have a very clear end state on or basically how the world should look once the change has been implemented. Uh, you need a key set of success criteria for that one to measure whether the change has been implemented. And also, fourthly, which is often forgotten, and I was guilty of the other one, is to ensure you have a senior member of management with overall responsibility for the change. Um, he or she can actually help support it. So to try to do a work for example on this, regarding what is changed, the end state, for example, I've been working very really heavily on Brexit, which I'm sure all of you are aware of, and we're very much focused on the no deal change, so no deal uh, situation when it was back in uh, I think the end of October. So the strategic reason for doing the change was, well, we've got no choice, the world is doing the no deal, so you must do it. The end state was really around no deal, was almost like by the end of the 1st of November, the day after no deal, the company was still operating. It was very simple as that. A, a, uh, the key sets of criteria was getting the company was running normally as, one, as normal as one can after that. And the senior management, I was very fortunate at the CEO, which was very good in some ways, but not good enough because he put me as a bit of a task master. So the key question you have to ask yourself is if you cannot uh, in these be defined at the start of the change, then you should really step back and ask you, should you be doing this change? Otherwise you're say, wasting a lot of time and money. To actually gather this data, I've got, I have called it a six-step six model, uh, which is somewhat glamorous. It's not really a model at all, it's just a list of thinking. Uh, and the first item is really to define the reasons why the end state and the project sponsor have discussed. You then need to work with the project sponsor to find out who the impacted groups are. So again, using a Brexit project, we obviously involve people from sales, client distribution, 
technology group, legal groups, and they were all brought to the steel code. You then need to work with each individual stakeholder to define how they see success. And this is actually quite a challenging one because you, know, you get five people in a room and you get six views on success. So, for example, many years ago I did a lot of outsourcing work and offshoring work, and the primary reason for that was to start uh, sort of cutting costs or cutting staff costs to be more precise. And what we ended up doing was, you know, you speak to the finance director and he or she would say the, um, the, reason, the success criteria is to cut staff costs by 10%. You speak to HR and they want all the staff treated humanely. You speak to the client services team and they say, well, basically we want nothing to change from the client's point of view. So you end up with very, very different, uh, way, uh, different success criteria. That can be then obviously counteracted by um, weighting each of the individual success criteria um, so it matches there. The key point there, number five, which is documenting the gaps, issues, or unknowns. This is a key theme for the whole presentation. So you really need to show any gaps or issues and document it. So if you've got conflict and success criteria, you've got conflict on steer, steer code members, you need to document that early because obviously you know, it will cause problems further on. And then the final thing is you need to get everything approved by the project sponsor and the steer code. And if you've got a strong, good project sponsor, he or she should help with that. So, uh, looking at that, so what you've done now, you've actually done the pre work so you've defined the end state, where you want to be. You've now decided what success is. And then you can sort of drop down a level into the detail to try and determine, uh, assess the change, to try and get some shape around it. And there's three areas there. Uh, the first area is understanding what needs to change, uh, which is traditionally called the scope, although other project methodologies call it differently. Linked to that is understanding that the organisations that are making the change has the skills and, tech and the capabilities to make the change. Uh, something called a change capability, I've written a number of articles on. And the last one is understand where the environment where the change is being made. The logic behind that is if you don't know the environment what you've got to change, how can you change it successfully? So if we just drill down quickly at each of those, and for some reason I've chosen the one at the bottom to go first, apologies to that. So if we look at uh, understanding where the environment, where the change needs to be made, and again, just to repeat what I mentioned earlier, if you don't understand the environment where the change is being made, then how can you be expected to change it? You know, if you don't understand that. And the environment where change is made is very, very complicated, and it will cover your own organisation. And if you recall back to the themes earlier on in the presentation, it covers areas such as uh, your clients, because obviously you may have links with clients. Some of these could be uh, large B2B clients, and they need, you need to understand how they operate. Everybody has some sort of suppliers, whether they're major outsourcers or what have you, you need to understand that. Um, need to any market infrastructure changes, like if you need to involve banks or your data providers or your internet providers. And most firms are regulated in some way, so any major changes may have an impact to um, uh, regulators. And this is often an area, from my experience, and I may be generalising because I am somewhat biased, that's often overlooked in change management methodology. However, most environments are actually poorly documented. Uh, and again, this is from my experience, and I don't want to do a disservice to people who've got good experience with this. You've either got no documentation, uh, or you can't find the documentation in some of these C drive buried under the desk somewhere. The documentation you've got is out of date. You know, you've got some maybe some database schemas that are clearly out of date. You've got conflict in documentation, and I've worked in places where you've got different schemas and it just don't even match, which is like which one's which. You've got gaps in documentation where people are either not documented properly or being too busy doing other stuff and you drag off. Or more worryingly, you do have documentation, but it's, there's a number of gap that's actually wrong. Um, in a strange way, that's the worst out of them all. At least if you've got no documentation or the others, you know you've got an issue. With incorrect documentation, you can assume it's correct. Therefore, you can understand documenting the current environment where the change needs to be made could take a while, but I hope you understand from the reason I give it's essential. However, I, I, when I approach this with my clients, there's a, um, a four, not a five-step process that I can follow. Again, this is probably very high level. I think the point to understand is that environmental documentation is a massive area, and uh, there are numbers of courses on this. But this is hopefully give you an idea of the thinking you need to follow. I think the first one is you need to do some sort of business architecture diagrams. 
and these can be used to cover all the processes and the interactions between all the various elements. And on the bottom right hand corner of the slide, I've done a very, very simple diagram for a sort of an online website where you've got, you know, retail customers, which is hash one, I think, and institutional clients or providing information to the website. Uh, obviously, most businesses are this is very simple and far more complicated, but what it gives you is a very, very good high level flow of what needs to be done. And behind each of these sort of boxes or entities and data flows, you probably need to do a bit of data drilling around. You know, what does it actually do? Why is it required? Who operates it? What the inputs and what the outputs technology use and what the clients it supports. But again, just stress this is a very high level approach. The next one you probably need to think about is customer dynamics uh, or uh, customer and product dynamics, I stand corrected. I think the challenge here is obviously we've all got clients and products that we use. And therefore, it's important we understand what, 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 how they be impacted by the change of what we're doing. And there are almost a lot of people have different types of customers. And if you work for a bank, you're going to have retail punters on the street like me, you work on my 2015 bank account, but you might have large institutional clients. If you work for the government, your clients could be people who pay tax, if you work for net revenue, you're the taxpayers. If you work for a charity, your customers could be the people you're looking after as a charity or it could be people who donate to you. So you need to have a think about what the customers are because it's important. Uh, once you understand the customers, you can probably have an area to think about the organizational charts or the areas that are impacted. And this is really to try and understand, you know, basically which people, which bodies you need in place to run the business. Uh, and again, this isn't an easy task by any stretch of imagination. It covers, as I mentioned on the very bottom of the slide, a number of internal areas. Uh, such as uh, like in terms of departments, as well as you need to ensure that you understand the organisations or the interactions with customer suppliers and industry bodies. And again, once you've documented the business architecture diagrams, uh, understood the customer dynamics and put the organisational charts in place, you need to understand what gaps you've got. And I mentioned before, this is going to be a common theme through um, the, pro the simple process, uh, managing uncertainty and gaps. So you, you could have issues with business architecture diagrams because you don't, no one fully understands all the data flows for a very complex system. You may not be able to understand all the clients that are impacted and you may not be able to start to understand all the organisational structures, especially if they are you know, your suppliers or your customers. It's also a good idea to understand how complex the environment is. I mean, the logic behind that is the more complex it is, the harder it is to change. And normally, there is no easy way to define complexity, but I tend to go along the lines of as the more lines and boxes there are, the more complex it is. I mean, it's, not, it's a little bit of a generalisation, but it tends to work. First, also understanding the constraints around the change in the environment. For example, you, well, internally, you may have the ability to implement technology changes as and when you see possible, but if you've got supplier and customers integration to put in place, uh, or even regulatory deadlines, you need to ensure that you, you can fit it with the suppliers. So the supplier can only do changes at quarter end, you need to fit your changes around that so it's not five minute tasks. And the other key one is the uh, saturation of change, which is the very bottom one, is that basically lots of other firms have uh, lots of change in progress at once. Therefore, overlaying more change on an environment that's being changed is a tricky undertaking. And you end up with a scenario you completely think you've defined the current environment and then when you look at it you think oh my god it's changed because somebody's done some extra software upgrades or something like that and then finally at least again a final sort of like key theme here is that it's important that the business sponsor and the steer co approve and sign off these the, the documentation uh, and it's probably more important they understand the implications of any gaps and issues for example, if they know full well that you can't fully document the business architecture, well, I don't think they'll be jumping down the streets. They will, they will struggle, to, they will need to understand the implications that could cause problems further on. So therefore, we've done the, um, the, the bottom ticked box there, understanding the environment where the change is being made. The next area in this group relates to ensuring the organisation has the capability to make the change. Again, this is uh, obviously uh, exactly what it says on the tin, really. So if you're, a change, if you're going to implement change into an organisation, you need to understand that you've got the right skills to make it done. Um, again, otherwise, how will you make the change? 
Um, and this covers things like, you know, if you've implemented some technology change, if you've got the right technology skills, if you're opening a new sales office in West Germany or East Germany, you need to understand, um, you know, do you have like, the right understanding of the culture of Germany? So it's a very vague but wide subject that you need a lot of focus. Again, this is often forgotten in some change methodologies. Right, I'm just going to pause there for a sec, because I've seen a few people post some questions on now. I'm just going to bear with me two seconds. Um, no, I had some questions popping up, I think, and I think they've gone away. So I do apologise. So therefore, while you can define your organisation capability, you can split it into four main sort of like groups. Uh, the first three, which is leadership, organisational, human, are very much at the uh, sort of like corporate level. And the last one, hence its name, is change specific. So looking at those individually, so from a, a change, uh, from a leadership point of view, the capabilities you need internally to make the change successful is, is clear, visible, vocal and consistent support from senior management. Uh, if you can get your leaders to provide that information, that'd be brilliant. Um, it's very vague what you need, but obviously you need your sponsor to, to support your change, to help you address issues. You need vocal support then to you know, answer questions, do presentations if required. At an organisational level, and this is more around governance and process and controls, you need an organisational wide change uh, committee that is required to manage change across the organisation. Most organisations, I feel like all organisations will have a stack of changes being run, many projects or at different stages. A lot of them will take, will drag on you know, subject matter experts, business staff, technology staff, consultancy staff. So the firms need a uh, <coughs> need the need to manage this at a level to ensure that it's focused on everything that's appropriate to the organisational strategy. At a more day-to-day -day level, uh, there needs to be a single organisational strange implementation process that can be uh, manage each change. You, know, you want consistency across the process. But the key thing is to ensure that the process can be tailored to fit the type of change you're doing. So if you've got a large change that involves you know, outsourcing a major part of your function, so your data centre, that change will be very, very different to um, a change where you're just doing systems upgrades. So you may have different checks on it. You also need a change control process, which needs to be implemented. Uh, all changes change to the worst change. All, all changes have their scope change, their timeline change, their cost change during the implementation. This is not always a problem, things happen. You know, you have a regulatory change like Brexit, it gets moved back, so you need to adjust. Therefore, you need a process to manage these changes and discuss the impact of the change individually, as well as a lot of wider changes. Now, for example, if you delay Brexit or Brexit is delayed for you, Back to the end of January, you could have had a major new product launch or software change due to go live at the end of January. You might have to review whether that's still valid. And also, organisations just need to ensure they've got sufficient resources to implement the change. Now, moving on to the human elements, uh, and this is where it's a little bit intangible and vague. On the human side, uh, the culture must be supportive of the change. As I mentioned earlier, human resource and people management skills are essential. Remember that, obviously, we hope you find that humans diagram earlier, uh, that uh, uh, people need to be managed through the journey of change. Uh, again, it's not a five-minute task and needs to be done. And likewise, good communication is essential, and that's ensuring that when you communicate progress, you communicate issues, and you involve people in the communication process. Uh, like the chain, a couple of projects I've worked on, we were doing daily communications on go-live dates that everybody knew what was going on. Another project is a monthly update onto our local website and senior management. So it's very appropriate where you are at the change. And last but not least on this is the uh, change specific capability. So therefore, you just, a lot of this stuff's reasonably obvious. You need super skilled people to be in place. Again, you know, as I mentioned before, if you're doing a piece of technology, you want people to understand the technology who's working on it, who's got skills in it. You need suppliers of any physical materials. And the last one here, I put down infrastructure to support the change initiative. Uh, and this relates to, obviously, if you're doing a software change, you need test environments, you may need uh, test data. If you've got a project team, you might have a project room, you might need project folders or whiteboards, anything like that. It's very, very appropriate to each individual change. 
Um, and the challenge here also is that this, a similar change capability needs is required uh, for your customer suppliers and market infrastructure. So if you're doing a big change with a customer and the customer's impacted, you probably need to find out how their change capabilities and do you think they have the skills to make the change, which believe me is a very, very tactful discussion um, and tread very carefully like your next shields. But with suppliers, you can lean on a little bit longer because you're paying the bill. Market infrastructure, like ways you tend to pay a bill. But it's ensuring that all the people involved in the chain have the right skills and capabilities to make the change. So therefore, now moving on to the next item, which is the third element under change assessment, is understanding what change, sorry, understanding what change actually needs to change. And this is um, basically, if you're implementing the change, then you need to know what to change. And again, very, very obvious. This is often commonly called the scope under various, te te uh, under various project management or change management methodologies. I think, again, anybody who's been through this, the process of defining what needs to change is, is challenging, hard work, re requires lots and lots of reviews, and it can be very stressful, but it is important. Again, I've, normally I approach this in a sort of like a four step process. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it very much a model, it's not, it's not it's not challenging enough to be a model. But the first one, and I'm going from left to right, the first item relates to convert the end state into requirements, which is requirements gathering in good old uh, print speak. Once you've got the requirements, you need to convert them into a set of tangible deliverables, or as my old boss said, you need to deliver it into a list of stuff that I can deliver. You need to understand any gaps, uh, any gaps or undocumented or issues. Again, this is a common theme. And last, again, another common theme to ensure senior management and other stakeholders are fully aware of any issues. So again, this is obviously a, a large area of requirement definition, probably a good couple of hours on it. But again, I'll just skim over the main parts. So therefore, the first item is to try and determine what a requirement is. Again, I'll borrow this from the internet. It's a uh, definition of a distinct need to be able to be an objective, uh, set externally, and need to be easily tested. So, for example, the requirements would be the native, possibly the ability to open a client account, close a client account, amend a client account. It's all very, very generic stuff. Obviously, quite very important needs to be done. Uh, requirements can either be functional or non-functional. Uh, Functional requirements tend to sort of have a business need, which is quite easy to document. Non-functional tend to be around things like availability of systems, uh, application uh, volume, processing volumes. Again, I worked at a derivative trader many years ago, uh, and one of the non-functional requirements was to be able to trade 86,000 transactions a second, uh, which was, was a challenge, but it was very clear because they wanted to cope with market crashes. Requirements can be gathered in a variety of methods, uh, interviews, focus groups, questionnaires, uh, and they need to be documented so there's no misinterpretation. Uh, some methodologies call a requirements definition document, but you, know, you can do document in many different ways. The next step is that once you've actually now defined the requirements, the requirements are obviously very important, but they aren't always that easy to understand to implement. So they need to be converted from a set of requirements into a scope of tangible deliverables or things that can actually be implemented. And this can be done um, in a number of ways. Again, it's a very broad and wide deep subject. So again, apologies for this almost skipping across the top. But I normally the way I would do that is to review the previously created um, requirements, on the, which is step one on that slide against the business architecture, client diagrams, and organizational charts to see what needs to change to meet the requirements. Again, very simple process, but requires a lot of work. And these deliverables can be documented in various formats, uh, deliverables, documents. I quite like a hierarchical diagram where you have everything, you know, all the breakdown and link them to the requirements. Uh, again, it's very visual and very good to get done. Uh, the third item, again, a common theme around documenting gaps. Again, this is going to be dotted all right through this presentation. Basically, what we need to do is any any known, any gaps, any issues need to be clearly documented so people know what they are. For example, you may have a requirement, for example, um, that's very clear. 
but because you don't understand the current operating model or the current business architecture, you don't really know what tangible deliverables are required. Therefore, you can document them in a very clear and concise manner saying, we don't, we're not 100 sure that we've got everything covered here. We can proceed, but bear in mind, we're going to have to loop back. And last but not least, the requirements, deliverables, or tangible deliverables, and the list of issues need to be reviewed and signed up by the project sponsor and state code. So they are very clear of what challenges you as an implementation manager and team have got. So therefore, we've actually now uh, covered the uh, pre-work, so we know what the end state is and what success is. We've now gone through change assessments, so we understand what needs to change. We understand the organisation has the skills, capabilities to make it, and we understand the environment, what needs to be changed. So we've got a pre-assessment. Now we've done that piece of work, we can actually move down to define the implementation approach. And um, I'm almost like, got ahead of myself. So basically what it involves the implementation approach is taking all the uh, organised, all the changes delivered earlier or defined earlier, and then basically put them in a sequence or group them in a fashion or order them in such a way that it can be delivered as minimal without as, with as minimal risk as possible. Again, a very simple diagram to cover the base area. Again, stress that this isn't a five-minute task, even though I will sound like it when I'm talking. Uh, the, uh, well, I've looked at it in three steps. The first one is to define the implementation approach, uh, which is almost like a project plan or an implementation plan for, for those who remember the 80s. Uh, once you've got that in place, you need to define a governance of structure, and that is way of control, ensuring that the implementation doesn't go off the screen. And again, the final thing here, if any final sign up from project sponsors need to be completed. So looking at the first item, which is defining an implementation approach, again, it's, it's converting the list of activities into a set of hierarchies and into a delivery approach. I always like hierarchical initially because it's very visual, but that's just me. No, there's no best way of doing it. You need to then determine the resources for each activity, and resources is a very vague management term. It doesn't cover, it doesn't cover people, but resources could be involved in test environments, access to test data, access to other people. Then you have an implementation approach that matches the change being made. Uh, and I've again very simplified this for the purpose of this presentation. You have a waterfall approach, which is often us, people like me call it a traditional approach, which is very linear. You know, it's task one follows task two, and you know, task two follows task three. It's very good where, uh, uh, where the requirements are very clear and the tangible development deliverables are very clear. But there is a perception of waterproof or fork can appear slow. At the other end, you have iterative or agile, and this often works best. Again, slight generalisation when the requirements are unclear. Uh, the changes are often done quicker, uh, but requires a lot more stakeholder input on a day to day basis. But I think the key point to what work is if you've got a large change, you could have a number of waterfall developments need to put in place, you could have a number of agile developments to be put in place. Especially if you're working with external vendors, they have their own way, or clients, they have their own way of working. So I think the key thing is most big projects have some sort of hybrid. And also, again, my favourite thing, common theme, any issues and worries need to be clearly documented so they're not forgotten. Therefore, moving on to the next step. <coughs> uh, once you define the implementation approach, whether it's agile, waterfall, or hybrid, or whatever approach you see necessary, you need to have a governance structure around it. And that is very much around the lines of ensuring that um, you, there's controls and checks in place that, that things happen. So you might want to group your work into a number of work streams. So you might want a front-end work stream, a back-end work stream, a database work stream, uh, a legal work stream, a marketing work stream, etc. But again, there's no right way or wrong way of grouping it. Uh, it's really just an appropriate way of trying to group the work into buckets so there's some sort of control. Therefore, for each of the work streams and the change entirely, you need to put some progress tracking controls in, which is a very polite way of saying, how can I ensure that things don't go off track? And you might want to have regular steer co meetings where you have to report to seniors. Um, very important to do that because they can be very uncomfortable if you're running behind. You might want regular working group meetings. Again, projects I've worked on, they can be weekly, two weekly, twice a week, every other week. I mean, the least we get, it very much depends on what the approach you're doing. And you want some regular updates, so I tend to do like weekly reports just to prove that it's on target or not, as case may be. 
you want to track your resource usage, uh, especially if you're borrowing resources from other people. Nothing annoys people more if they then use somebody to work on the project and then suddenly they don't turn up or they need to extend them. You need to track issues, uh, I'll keep them again around issues. You want regular reporting to be in place, obviously a working group that was a little bit more, uh, let's say you'd be a little bit more uh, working than like. But you know, if you've got reports of senior management who are probably running a multi-billion pound dollar business or a massive charity or a government organisation, you want to make sure that you report to them at the right frequency with the right information. Again, speaking to project sponsor always helps on that. Regular communication, we sort of covered earlier on. And remember, if you've got any issues with the governance structure, to ensure it's clearly documented uh, so it's not forgotten. Again, and we may guess what's coming last. Is final sign off and approval from the project sponsor to ensure they're aware of anything that's going. And from, especially when you get into governance, uh, especially it's uh, governance, and I work with a number of large managers who we need to report to the regulator on changes, um, it becomes a very big subject. But on the positive side, approved management are, in, are, are involved. So, therefore, right now, so we've done the pre work, uh, we should define any end state, etc. We've assessed the change around what needs to change the environment and ensuring the organisations have the skills. We've now defined the implementation approach, and I'm here all cheering down the line. We can actually now start to implement. Um, and uh, this is obviously um, to remember, and this is the reason I tend to focus on the preparation, is that you know if you do good preparation, um, then hopefully the earliest steps in, in, the, in the book, which should be in the uh, slide deck, should actually put you in a good basis to implement the change. But unfortunately, good preparation is good, but you still have to be on the, on the, on the ball during the implementation itself. Uh, so during the implementation, a number of hints and tips I've worked up during my life doing this, which is many years, unfortunately. The first one is to be paranoid about things going wrong, delayed, overrunning, not happening. So you really need to become a neck. Uh, tracking people, you know, people promise to do something on a Wednesday, maybe on the Tuesday to say to them, are you still located that by tomorrow? You need a lot of proactive changing of tasks. You need to look at your implementation schedule every on a regular basis. I mean, I'm doing two projects at the moment, and I'm looking at both on a daily basis to check things that should have started, have started, and stuff that started is progressing. It's again really almost like a clipboard management. You need to track the issue hook, like issue hook, issue log like a hawk. Obviously you've picked up a number of issues in earlier parts of the project or the change definition, you need to monitor those to make sure everything's covered. Again, it's been very proactive and you need to ensure you've got the governance process agreed earlier. Nothing can annoy senior management and steer codes is if you, send, if you agree to do a monthly report and you don't do a monthly report, it could be the end of a very promising change career. Uh, so what could go wrong? And I've only got two sides on this, I could probably write several books on this. Uh, there is resistance to change, uh, that happens, that's life unfortunately. I think with resistance is often trying to find out why people are resistant to it. Uh, my old boss many years ago said there's two reasons people have resistance to change. One is a very clearly articulate logical reason and the second one is the real reason. So I think it's the case of trying to dig down into people's resistance to find out what the resistance to change is. And you know, those resistance is bad. They could have resistance because you've missed something out or you've got the wrong end of the stick. So you need good human skills there. There is a large amount of conflict or tension around the change within the change team. Again, stressful time to change, especially people who are uh, doing uncomfortable things. Again, I'm trying to understand what's caused that. Uh, the change project team seems to have a large number of problems, setbacks, issues, causing delays. Unfortunately, that is a side effect of doing complex change things. Again, that's where your skill as a change manager or running change initiatives is to try and motivate the team, tackle the big issues, and try and prioritise. The people in the change team do not have the correct skills, i.e., technical skills or people management skills. Again, as soon as you notice this, this needs to be tackled. Normally, I would, if I don't think I've got the right skill, I would obviously try and help people to gain the skills, but it may be a case of speaking to management to get some assistance. Uh, people complain and do not know what's happening with the change. Again, all, this is where they only need to have communication. If somebody's moans that they don't know what's going on, have a chat with them, speak to them, buy them coffee, try and understand what they want to know about the change and alter the communications plan to meet that. Stakeholders or people can't see the benefit of the change. 
Again, you probably need to speak to them to understand why they don't see the benefit, try and explain it to them. This is where senior management support, which is vocal and leadership, comes in very good because if your project sponsor is very supportive, he may be able to bridge that gap and make people understand it. Again, there is lack of commitment to change. And this is probably similar to the one above it about the benefits. It'd be very good for this is where you can if you've got good senior and supportive management. Uh, we can actually you can actually get them to help out. Uh, for a large project, uh, say 12 months or even six months, and the size is relative, there aren't there aren't very deliverable. There doesn't seem to be any deliverables, um, which is very can be very demotivating. You're working on something, and you don't be seen to be seen to be delivering everything. I think this is where probably uh, you probably need to play around with the delivery schedule to ensure that you have some deliverables. Even if you manufacture some deliverables, because um, there's nothing like people like putting tick in the box. Again. But on the other hand, some projects are so large, there's not much you can do about that. Uh, there is constant flow of scope creep, uh, the scourge of contract with uh, change projects. Uh, I think this is where as a project manager or a change manager it has to be reasonably strong. Uh, if you've documented everything up front, you've got, an eye, uh, you've got your governance in place, you've got your implementation approach. If something comes in that's not on there, you need to raise it to say, like, it's not on the scope, I can't do that. Therefore, what I need to do is work work on, um, uh, excuse me, raise a change request. It's not a bad thing if scope creeps because you may, you know, if you've got a long change, the environment changes and you may need to work on things. Um, and there's constant slippage. Um, and this is, I think there was a book from years ago, I think it was called The Magic of Silver Bullets. And he says, big projects don't slip all at once, they slip day, one day at a time. And I think it's probably the most true statement I've ever heard. And this is where I think on the previous slide I put down um, constant tracking, being paranoid, being a nag, being a pain in the backside. If you constantly chase stuff, you shouldn't get any small slippage. And if you do have slippage, you can always escalate it. I mean, for example, if you're doing a commercial negotiation with somebody external, you know, one of the, you may not be able to actually get, you may miss deadlines because you're doing the contract negotiations. Nothing wrong with that. If you're doing constant uh, monitoring, you should be able to track any constant slippage. Uh, moving on, I've only got another half slide on this, and uh, I could have wrote books on this, but I value your sanity. Is uh, what could go wrong, part two, uh, or slide two? There is lack of governance around the process, which caused problems with the plan not being updated, issues not being tracked, poor documentation. Again, another common problem. People don't always see the importance of project governance. I think again, this is where you need a strong project manager to enforce, or change manager to enforce this happening. And also, if you've got a good project sponsor, he or she should enforce this as well. Problems with managing suppliers, and that's a problem generally. I think you just need to uh, understand how the suppliers work, make it crystal clear what you want from them. And if they don't, if they push back, you just need to escalate and push them back. Uh, another one is procrastination. Uh, stakeholders constant delay and often making decisions. Always want an extra bit of information, or always want an extra bit of information, or another review meeting. Again, nothing. That's always a tricky one to do, especially if they're not your staff or they're more senior than you or even clients. I think the key thing here is just make it very crystal clear in what the impact of not making a decision by a certain date is. For example, you know, if you have, if you've looked, if you've got a go live date at the end of January you will probably say it's going to take a week of the previous weekend to do the implementation. Therefore, what I want to do is make sure that we can um, implement by the end of January. And if you don't give us a decision by mid of January, we're going to miss the deadline. If you put it in basic terms like that, you need to, um, people clearly understand it. The other one is too much work in progress. Uh, this is where if you've got a very good governance at a senior level, they should be able to determine you've got there's too much change work that's going on. Which ultimately means you either stop stuff, you skip down the scope, you do sort of like skinny implementations, or you try and get more people in. Uh, again, if, if this is where it needs to be escalated. The chain seems to be running on for ages and has never delivered anything useful. The ultimate you know, efficiency approval project. Again, this is a case of where you just need strong project management and strong sponsor uh, to obviously to try and ensure there are deliverables in the program. Plus lots and lots and lots of others, and I'm sure there's about 40 or people on this call, uh, including four around the table here. We could probably come over another hundred. Right, just before we, oops, oh, very fun.
This is before we pass on to the next stage. I noticed some people posted some questions which I've already really ignored, so I'm just going to try to scroll down those. And uh, this is from Neil. I can hear you. Oh, sorry, it's a bit fun. Right, well, perhaps these are all questions that come back from the previous one. Right, okay, bear with us, right? Right, don't mind. Right, read the question. Read the question there. Right. And I'll come back to that later since the one probably to the question stage is probably due to my incompetence and anything else. So back to the presentation. So under the what we've done now, we've done all the pre-work, we've done the change assessment, we've defined the approach, you've implemented the change, and everybody loves you. And now it's almost to do some sort of like feedback, post implementation review to do a constant view. So basically this involves two parts. One is actually a very simple question. Was the change successful? Yes or no? I mean, or yes, no. And there's various levels of sort of vagueness on this. And the next item is to complete a post implementation review. And again, I'll come to that. So looking at, um, looking at the very first one, was the change successful or not? Again, if you've done all the work up front, we've suggested, so you've documented the end state, you've documented the um, success criteria, then you should be able to really define whether the, the, the sex criteria was hit. Uh, sometimes they're not hit, um, which is not always good, they're not always bad, because sometimes they're outside your thing, but if you've had very clear success criteria, you can have a, a decent view of what's been done. But however, probably the most important one, uh, I've always, and it's often forgotten, and I always try and do it, is some sort of post-implementation review. I think some authorities call it a post-mortem, but that implies something's gone drastically wrong. A post-implementation review is almost taking a step back to see how well the change went. So therefore, regardless of whether the change has been successful or not, then I would strongly suggest that a post-implementation review is done. Uh, this will obviously allow you as an organisation or other organisations um, to determine what went well and, um, and what didn't go so well and what could be improved on. There is a tendency of this um, to become a blame game or a finger pointing game. Um, you know, testers blame the developers, developers blame the analysts and the analysts blame the business and everybody blames everybody else and basically no one knows what's going on. So therefore I think when you implement that post implementation review, you need to be reasonably strong. And I've suggested three principles here. Uh, I've actually thought of a fourth one while I was talking, which I'll add on as I go through. So I think all the feedback should be open and honest. Uh, I think people shouldn't, shouldn't be worried about uh, providing feedback. Uh, I know some people are always quite nervous and may offend people or burn bridges with people. The, f the feedback should focus on facts and should be supported by evidence. And it's not a case saying the developers are rubbish. And that's not really feedback. They should, they, you should say back the developer was rubbish. And this can be evidenced by, you know, we had 21,000 defects on the first run. You know, and you can argue that is, a, that is a problem. And also it's very important to focus on what went well as, as, as well as went badly. Because, you know, good lessons are nice lessons. And the fourth one now, which I just thought about when I was talking is, the ability to report anonymously. Uh, I've just done a post implementation review for a client. And it, I won't go into the details of it, but it wasn't a really well run project and there was a lot of tension and a lot of nastiness in politics. And the only way I could actually get people to speak out was to do it anonymously. Um, so I managed to get all the information that we're on a no names basis. Uh, but obviously that depends on the organisation. Again, uh, a very simple process to try and uh, de uh, do, uh, to decide what we do. The first one is to design the questionnaire or the list of questions you want. Best to try and do a very open question. What do you think went well? What do you think went wrong? What could be improved on? Do you think anything could be improved on with deployment? You know, very wide open questions. So you're trying to gather information as opposed to yes or no. You need to issue the questionnaire. Again, speak to the CEO and the product sponsor, and you, you should be able to give the list of people to work, send it out to. But obviously, you, you, as you work through the progress of the project, you'll have a number of people. Once, give them a reasonable amount of time, maybe a week, two weeks, depending on the organisation, uh, and then you should re receive back responses. If people aren't forthcoming, which is usual, because normally when a project's gone live, they're sick and tired, the last thing I'm going to do is talk about it again would be you know, offer to do a one-to-one -one face meeting with them, maybe do a face, a focus group or a meeting session with them to gather the information. 
most important is to get the information in. Once that's done, you can review the responses, uh, create link recommendations, uh, and then, then review them with the steer code and make sure that any other relevant management. So it's not really the most complex process, obviously, this needs a little bit of thinking and a little bit of human management. So therefore, I think you chair, and we've now reached the end of the implementation of the chain. So again, it's a very high level skim over the process, and obviously some areas like requirements gathering, uh, planning is a massive area, which obviously is very tricky to cover in the confines of an hour presentation. So therefore, what we can do now is we've covered what is change, it's uh, with proactive, we went through six or seven key things for implementing change. We've now uh, implemented change successfully. We've gone through a very simple model, albeit at a very high level. Uh, and then we just go through some final wrap up points. So, and again, just to bring out some of the key points from earlier that implementing change is a systematic and controlled process. I hope that the, de the use of the, um, uh, the, the model demonstrates that you need to have ticks and checks and controls in place. There are large amounts of ambiguity and uncertainty. And I think we've probably, I've probably mentioned a few times, uh, there's, uh, you need to document this, make sure if any unknowns, risk and issues are clearly defined. Implementing change is hard work. Uh, I think everyone knows that. Uh, and requires focus and determination. The ability to manage people or stakeholders is essential. And we mentioned before, anything from dealing with stress, as well as stress, but I wouldn't say resistance, but stress is just a good one. Uh, dealing with conflict and everything like that, you need good people management skills. Implementing change is not an island, and the key point there is, you know, if you're doing a change, you need to ensure all stakeholders are, are implemented, whether they're clients, customers, uh, suppliers, other parts of the organisation are involved. So it's, you need to have a careful think about that. Cons competent and relatively skilled people are needed, so if you're implementing anything, you need the right skilled people. And that will cover technical skills like database design, understanding the outsourcing contracts, as well as all the people skills and the softer skills that need to be done. And last but not least, and this is the point I always stress when I um, speak with people in a very large change, change is a journey and uh, do expect problems. And I do like using the metaphor, the metaphor of a marriage that, you know, it's worthwhile in the end, but you, you can have good days and bad days and you need to work through problems. So therefore, that brings me to the close of this. Uh, so first of all, thanks for listening and thank you for your time. Uh, my contact details are there on my email, so please feel free to email me if you want. I've got my Twitter account there as well, so please feel free to follow me. Um, I'm actually up to double figures in my Twitter followers. And my LinkedIn account, so if you want to join or link in with LinkedIn, more than important. Um, for those who remember me from last time, I did a book on contracting, um, obviously, uh, um, it's still out there on the pane. Long term, I'm doing another book on change. And if I got my act together, I could shamelessly plug it this presentation, but fortunately, I'm running behind. So, thank you very much. I, I know we've got some people around here may have a few questions to ask, but um, hopefully, while they ask us, we'll start to work out a question box and hear the words. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Um, when you were talking about your definition of change, actually, yeah. uh, you didn't make you said about um, change or alteration to an activity. Yeah. Um, you didn't sort of explicitly say about well continuing the existence of I mean, the existence of the organisation. And change usually will involve a combination of new things, altered things, and abandoned things, while yeah. maintaining some level of yeah. service to customers. Yeah, I agree with you. So I maybe I always look at three groups. I look at the BAU data running of operations and stuff like that. I think the other extreme could change, but are you, you almost have an extra somewhere in between which you're implying. It's something like day, like day to day maintenance type of stuff. Yeah. So I think why I haven't covered the presentation, I will now next time I do it, thank you. But it's more of a case of I think you still need to follow the same sort of discipline to try and understand. I think, for example, if you do software changes, you, for example, when I run software teams in the past, you have a like an, a support team and it's often done day to day maintenance stuff, like small changes that are lots of benefit but not aren't quite big enough to warrant a full yes. project team. Yes. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh no questions or well, the other thing on the webinar too. Yeah. Uh... 
Right, the first question, how would you, as in me, go about defining the benefits, say benefits is a separate health in itself, and I am interested in knowing how you would first define the benefits during the project stages. Well, I think I always look at benefits at a very, a very high level. It's almost linked to the very first slide. I'll go back, I'll probably break the machine. Is that basically why are you doing this? That's the main reason for the benefits. Um, so, and when you do the benefits, you, when I mentioned earlier on, you do the definition of why you're doing the change. Once you're under that change, then you work out the success criteria for each of the areas in the business. Uh, so I would say that's how the benefits are defined. Uh, maybe you can replace benefits, sorry, success criteria with benefits. Um, I think the challenge you've also got to bear in mind, benefits are very local to the area. And I use the example of outsourcing for a deliberate reason, because I've done a lot of outsourcing in the past, and you would have very different views on what's success. So, for example, if you're doing an outsourcing project and it's there to cut costs, I mean, that's the most reason to do outsourcing, although people don't always say that. Uh, very much along the lines of it would be, you know, the finance director or the ops guys will probably say, well, basically, we want to cut ongoing costs, day to day costs by 20%, 10%. But other people have very different uh, views on benefits. So, I think benefits, I think key things where you can define at the beginning, you've got to bear in mind lots of them will have different views on it. And they could actually contradict. Are there any other questions? How do you, yeah, yeah, sorry. How do you define success as a change manager? Wow, I'm thinking of the heart question. Is that, I suppose you would say you deliver all the success criteria, really. Uh, but that's not always possible because there's lots of external factors that change. I mean, I use Brexit as a prime example because, you know, I was brought in to deal with Brexit for a firm at the end of October and I, I completely failed. Yeah, I did explain to my boss there was external factors that I couldn't control, right? Like, uh, the Tory party, the Labour party. I don't really know how you can really define it, really. I don't know what people around the table think. I mean, normally I just feel if you felt you've done your best and you've brought the, you've delivered the change as best you can with the external criteria, I think that's the best you can do, really. I don't know. Yeah. I think some, if it's to do with legislation, I think it's going to yeah. be a clear case you've either succeeded or you've or you failed. Yeah. If your change is that you're yeah. hoping to optimize yeah. efficiencies in some yeah. sort of sense, yeah. then you could argue the case on the basis that by the time you've finished, yeah. other things may have changed to to mm -hmm. upset it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good point that Stephen mentioned. I think one of the areas that hasn't come out in the presentation, um, which uh, you sort of hinted that while you're saying is that. You could implement the change. You could come up with a set. So you could come up with a set of success criteria. But then, as, as you as you start implementing the project or the change, <coughs> the environment changes, and suddenly what you're implementing is wrong. You know. So there is a, a maybe an extra step in here, almost like validate that change is still relevant. Almost. Um, I know a lot of firms will have like teams that, that keep them monitoring the industry, strategic planning type teams. But it's almost like having a step in the change process, which maybe should be incorporated here, along the lines of how do we ensure that the change we're implementing is still relevant. And, you know, I mean, Brexit is an example, I think or other regulations have been done. You know, a prime example could be you could be developing a new product for a client and that client base disappears, you know, and the market changes or they're not, you know, or, or somebody else is beating you to it, you might think well, there's no point doing it, you're not going to do it. Well, I'm just looking at a few other, well, that's all the other, all the questions I think that have been posted on the uh, question box, I think. Um, let's have a look. I'll quickly scroll down if you bear with me. Done it there. Right, I think that's it really. So, unless anybody's got any other questions, I suggest we are dead on time. I don't know if you really. I suggest we bring it to a close. So, uh, thank everybody for dialing in, uh, listening. Thank you for the welcome around the table, and uh, no doubt we will speak soon. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.